13 Lectures on General History of China by Liu Zheng Chapter 8, The Northern and Southern Song Dynasties 1. The consolidation of the imperial authority and the perfection of the imperial system ending the upheaval of the five dynasties, 907 to 60 AD. The Northern Song Dynasty, 960-1127 AD, unified China once again. Although the Song Dynasty inherited all the systems the Tang Dynasty, it paid much more attention to being precautious and mindful of small matters when it dealt with the internal and external problems which the state had to confront. The Song Dynasty, therefore, underlined that even the regulations on small matters should be improved and perfected in order to strengthen the control and supervision over officials. The expostulation system was changed drastically in the Song Dynasty. The Department of Imperial Supervision was granted the new duty of expostulation. Despite being originally responsible for supervision, with the tradition that the chancellors and expostulating officials would never be sentenced to death. The expostulating officials in the Song Dynasty became so powerful. Through this system, the ability of the emperor to manipulate chancellors had, on the one side, been strengthened. Simultaneously, though, the capacity of the chancellors to govern was weakened on the other side. Overlapping and redundant personnel were a feature of the political system in the Song Dynasty. Almost all the institutions in the central government which had been set up since the Sui and Tang Dynasty were preserved intact. Also many new bureaus were established to reinforce the power of the central government. Under this new arrangement, the whole of China was divided into 15 Liu. Situated in the middle, between the agency of the central government and the local governments, the Liu had the responsibility of supervising instead of administering. Institutions named Supervision Bureaus GNC, were set up in each Lu district. 2. The Imperial Examination The Imperial Examination that was created in the Sui and Tang dynasties was gradually perfected and became virtually the main means for drafting officials into government. It had been amended several times from Emperor Taizong of Song to Emperor Zhenzong of Song. Taking place every three years, the imperial examination had three levels, the provincial level examination, the national level examination, and the imperial court examination, the latter being under the personal charge of the emperor. The scale of the imperial examination under the Song increased from that under the Tang dynasty. The Song dynasty stipulated a more restrictive and rigorous procedure and a method of examination which guaranteed fair examination in procedure and substance. The graduates in the examination in the imperial court were called Jin Shi. These had three ranks. The highest level was called Jin Shi GD. The lowest level was called Tong Jin Shi Chu Shang. And the middle level was called Jin Shi Chu Shen. There was a special provision for older candidates who had passed the provincial examination but failed to pass the capital examination despite several attempts. The emperor had the power to grant them the title of Jin Shi Chu Shen. As its name suggested, the Song officials were actually dispatched to substantial positions in order to strengthen the reign of the imperial authority. 
The Jing officials were dispatched to the position of governors in the provincial governments. They were titled as Ji Fu which meant that officials had the privilege of becoming involved in local affairs. In the central government, the system of dispatch was implemented very often. The system of dispatch strengthened the emperor's control over the officials and at the same time weakened the power of the Ministry of Personnel and the Ministry of Defense. In legal practice, any disputes beyond the scope of the laws would be decided by summons. Thus, summonses became the most significant component and source of the Song Law since the era of Emperor Shenzong who even replaced the statutes by summonses which was put in the first forms of laws in order. At the peak of legal authority, the emperor's summonses had consolidated the imperial power in the legal system. In terms of punishment, two punishments, the death by skinning, lin kai, and exile with branding on face, see pay, were added into the criminal law. 3. An analysis of aspects of social life in the Song dynasties the men F.A. Shi Zhu gradually faded out of the picture in history. And the society enjoyed significant commercial economic development during the Song dynasty. Hence, there were two important changes to the matrimonial customs in this period. The first feature was that people paid less attention to the family backgrounds when establishing matrimonial relationships. Instead, it was more important to marry someone who had passed the imperial examinations. The second feature was that material fortune weighed more than political or family ties. It was commonplace for wealthy merchants to be married to the daughters of politically influential families in the Song dynasty. The well-preserved painting known as Along the River during the Qingming Festival, Qingming Shanghe II, by Zhang Zhejuan, 1085-1145 AD, is the best evocation of people's daily lives in Kaifeng. As the Song dynasty was succeeded by the Yuan dynasty, 1271-1368 AD, most historic cities remained prosperous. New groups of cities became active and famous due to the reuse of the Grand Canal, Jinghang Da Yunhe, and the opening of oceanic transportation. The temporary markets which emerged during the Tang Dynasty and were only located close to major cities, became more popular and appeared near all cities and even some villages by the Song Dynasty. 4. Religious beliefs and philosophy at the time Buddhism and Taoism were still the dominant religions in the Song Dynasty. Most religious ceremonial events in Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism were accepted by people as personal life interests. But with the social evolution, new contents were also added to the spiritual aspects of ordinary people. Guan Yu who was only respected in Hubei and Hunan provinces before the Middle Tang Dynasty, became a nationally recognized fictional hero during the Song Dynasty. The skills of choosing a location for a new mansion or a new tomb by divination, feng shui, were highly valued in the Song society. On a deep philosophical level, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism were further assimilated, leading to the development of Song Confucianism, Song Dai Li Shui. Later on, the Changzhou School, Changzhou Li Shui, 
was officially adopted by the Yuan Dynasty, 1271-1368 AD, and the Ming Dynasty, 1368-1644 AD, but over time its vigor diminished. In the early Qing Dynasty, 1644-1911, some provincial scholars began to consolidate this past knowledge and to envision a new future, which was to constitute an important chapter in the history of Chinese thought. With the dawning of the contemporary age, China gradually sank into being an oppressed nation. Modern Western ideas, especially in the area of political thought, entered into the country. This inevitably led to a collision between Chinese learning and Western learning. Finding a solution to this dispute, and seeking to establish harmony between the competing sides, became the main theme of contemporary Chinese thought. Buddhism was introduced into China from the end of the Western Han Dynasty and the early part of the Eastern Han Dynasty. Scholars of indigenous Chinese culture studied, modified, and assimilated Buddhism so that later on Buddhism with Chinese characteristics came into being. Some Buddhist ideas and perspectives, especially its method of thinking, were assimilated by Confucianism and Taoism, gradually becoming part of the thought system of Song Dynasty Neo-Confucianism. During the Southern and Northern Song Dynasties, great Taoist figures sprang up like bamboo shoots. Chen Tuan, d. 989 AD, and Zhang Boduan, 987. 1082 AD, issued new statements on the combination of the three religions and internal alchemy. All of these Taoist thoughts exerted major influence over Song learning and Neo-Confucianism. From the Sui and Tang dynasties to the Northern Song dynasty, all rulers WOR shipped and upheld the Taoist religion which led to its burgeoning development. The number of Taoist adherents mushroomed, and Taoist temples became widespread all over the country. From the perspective of philosophy, Taoist scholars sprang up like bamboo shoots, a reservoir of Taoist works came into being, and Taoist theory flourished without precedent. Zen Buddhism and the Fashong school both stressed the centrality of the mind, and this was to have a profound impact upon Chinese culture and thought. The philosophy of the mind came into being in the Song and Ming dynasties and is represented by Lu Juyuan, 1139 to 92 AD, and Wang Shoren. 1472-1528 Its mode of thought was directly influenced by Zen Buddhism. No human words or thoughts were adequate to express the absolute and real ontology. Early Indian Buddhism proposes that once one becomes a Buddhist monk you should no longer care about earthly issues. One should become completely separated from your family and should not care about national issues. Chinese Buddhism believes that when somebody becomes a Buddhist monk, they still need to respect their family maintain their loyalty to their monarch, and love their country. Therefore, some Taoist temples are named as Huguo Temple and Baohuo Temple. They think Buddhism nurtures people with great virtues for the nation, this being the ultimate loyalty and ultimate filial piety. The family of Zhu Shi, 1130-1200 AD, 
originated from Yangshi in the Southern Song Dynasty and he lived in Jianyang. He lectured continuously. Zhu Xi spent dozens of years painstakingly interpreting the four books, namely, The Great Learning, The Analects, Mencius, and The Doctrine of the Mean. His analyses of these four books are known collectively as the Commentary on the Four Books. This work is full of Zhu Zai's ideas and quite a few of his original extrapolations of the ancient Chinese characters. During the Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties, Neo-Confucianism flourished because of the popularity of the commentary on the four books. Zhu Xi contended that the four books should be studied in succession with the great learning coming first. Zhu Zai's general guiding principle is for the reader to experience Confucius's ideas and teachings. The next is Mencius which expounds Confucius's orthodoxy, critiques, and heterodoxies and promotes the innate goodness of human beings. The last is the doctrine of the mean. Through studying this, one should gain a heightened awareness of Confucius. Lifting one's study to a profoundly philosophical level. In ancient China, there was no word that corresponded directly to philosophy. However, there was a word similar to it, which comes from the commentaries on the Book of Changes, Xi Si. This contends that metaphysics is named as Tao, physics is named as Qi. This metaphysical Tao does not denote general knowledge. It signifies the Tao which explores the nature of things. Zhu Xi said this Tao refers to the rationale for the existence of things. We can use Li to describe it. Each of phenomena in the cosmos, nature and society has their own rationale for existing. Scholars should study all of these rationales and explore the reasons for the existence of things. These reasons we call Li. He therefore proposed the universality and particularity doctrine which states that everything originates from the heavenly principle. Just as the moon shines upon the landscape, the heavenly principle is manifested differently by everything that exists. This perspective was obviously influenced by Wyan sect. 